it starts on a computer and becomes a piece of carbon fiber on a two-mile racetrack. It's the skill of negotiating a turn at 200 miles an hour with challenge in the rearview mirror and danger ahead. It's the precision of design, calculated chances when seconds are crucial. It's getting to victory lane, a process of planning, practice, and patience. Nobody wins without the secrets of speed. The whole physical act of driving a racing car is not really people understand it to be. It's different. You can sit in an uncomfortable chair for three and a half hours and have somebody walk up to you and push you as hard as they can every three seconds. And you can't move. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask you a series of questions that you're going to have to give me the right answer because if you give me the wrong answer, I'm going to knock you across the head with a baseball bat. Racing is always changing. New scientific developments plant the seeds for increased safety in faster speeds. It's part physical, part metal, with technology doing the rest. Without some brutal lessons in racing history, the secrets of speed would never have been revealed. Computers, radios, and teamwork create a network behind a winning car. Teams can spend years hunting the formula for success. Mastering the secrets of speed is a painstaking task, which begins not on the race course, but on a computer. CAD, computer-aided design, is just the first step in creating the car flashing down the speedway. I look back and think about all the work that's gone into designing it. You know, the engineers, all the last little detail that they have to have to put that race car together. And once the guys have all that information, they put their parts together and pieces together and really get this car as one ready to roll out the shop door and get it onto the racetrack. So much work has gone into that, it really fascinates me. There's a, an awfully lot of engineering that goes into all of this to make the whole car work as one. You, although you have a variety of different segments that are put together to make a car, it has to work as one to work properly. Engineers spend long days and nights creating virtual blueprints. The computers kind of took some of the guesswork out of it and, you know, totally relying on the drivers. You could, you could see what the car is actually doing. And now it's probably as important tool as, as we have, really. Computers are a late 20th century addition to racing. Teams use computers to achieve maximum speed. They assist assembly of the entire car before it turns one lap on a super speedway. After the 3D designs are approved, they come to life using secret materials that increase speed and decrease injuries. Today's race cars are the safest in sports history. A reason is the carbon fiber material that covers the car from nose to tail. Lightweight for speed, yet sturdy to absorb a 170 mile impact into a concrete wall. The worst accident that you can have is one that just ends and looks very clean, just goes thunk. What you need is something that bounces, rolls, turns, pieces fly off, and you keep on moving. So you dissipate that energy over a very long distance. The crashes look very violent because there's a lot of parts flying, but the cars are really, really designed towards that. It's like punching your, your fist into a piece of foam versus punching your fist into a two by four. The foam absorbs your hand and dissipates all that energy, and that's why it doesn't hurt. Where if you punch your hand into a two by four, it takes everything that your hand has just hit that board and puts it straight back in your hand, and that's why it hurts. Carbon fiber is the race car's skin. The main chassis is molded and shaped in a giant kiln. Wings, wheels, and the guts of the car are added later. All specifications, height, width, and length, outside and inside, are customized to the size and shape of the driver.
Today's racer is a long way from the giant iron gladiators of the early 1900s. Bulkhead steel was the primary chassis material. Speed suffered, and so did driver safety. But engineers devised a way to get these two-ton cars around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway at a top speed of 80 miles an hour. That included a driver and a ride-along mechanic. Lighter materials came in the late 60s with the monocoque chassis made from aluminum sheets. It increased speed and the risk of injury. Cars smashed like a can of soda pop. The idea was right. Get the car low to the ground, but a new design was needed to dissipate energy when the machine made a violent impact. That would come in time. Secrets of speed are found inside this performance wind tunnel. Here, Reynard tests chassis for tomorrow's open-wheeled racers worldwide. Many teams disguise their pre-race routines. They test confidential creations in secret and work out design flaws before one mile is put on the car. First, a scaled replica of the car is built. A giant fan blows head-on into this model, testing the car's aerodynamic efficiency. When a car is designed, it spends days and days and days in the wind tunnel. And when in the wind tunnel, they change little shapes on it. They try to cheat nature by using as much of the airflow as they can over the car to their advantage. And by that, I mean they want to have the highest downforce they can have with the least amount of drag. The wind tunnel is a reality check for computer-created designs. Flaws mean a return to the computer drawing board. More testing is necessary for the infrastructure of the car. Under the skin is a complex labyrinth of circuits, pipes, levers, and switches, all secrets of speed. The heart of the racing machine is the engine. Hidden within the chassis is the driving force for the world's fastest cars. Sheer horsepower gets teams running at over 200 miles an hour. There is more to maintaining that pace, hour after hour. Endurance is often just as important as speed. Fuel plus air is always equal to horsepower. Your goal is, is to funnel that air towards the air inlet to actually maximize or pressurize your air box, similar to a turbocharger does, but what you're trying to do is force all that air into the motor. Two kinds of engines rule the open-wheeled circuits, turbocharged and normally aspirated engines. The turbocharged engine provides more fuel and air to the cylinders. In turn, the car goes faster. In NASCAR, Formula One, and American Open Wheeled Racing Series, eight cylinders or a V8 configuration is standard. The engine is nearly 30% of the car. 400 pounds is the average. Each series design enhances the configuration to best suit the car. In NASCAR, we see the closest comparison to the cars we drive every day. The inside of this stock car shows a 650 horsepower engine fed fuel through a carburetor. They are called stock cars because they lack high-tech configurations. No electronics alter the power of the engine. A special device called a restrictor plate is sometimes used to reduce the fuel fed to the engine. This design brings better competition and slower speeds. An average cost for a 30-race season is $200,000 per engine. The emphasis is on driving, not technology. This simple philosophy is working. The NASCAR Series is the fastest-growing sport in the nation. Indy Racing League teams buy their engines. Upgrades are made on a year-to-year -year basis. The cost for one engine runs a team nearly $100,000. Testing the 700 horsepower engines is expensive and dangerous. An accident can be catastrophic. Testing is a relentless cycle that makes for another secret of speed. Racing teams have developed a way to test engines without driving the car. A dyno runs an engine to see if the car can stand the rigors of a 500 mile race at over 200 miles an hour. You can put an engine on now put the Indy 500 chip in, and go away and come back three and a half hours later and see what happened. And it will just run as if it was a race. It will give you 20 laps flat throttle, maybe that were green laps, there was no traffic. Then it will go through a few yellow segments. So we, we try to simulate everything you would have on a race 
on the dyno. Unlike production cars, race car engines are highly perishable. These engines will expire at 550 miles, just long enough to endure one or two races. Managing a fragile engine means taking care of it in every way. That includes the juices that get the engine going. The fuel that feeds these high-tech monsters is just as exotic as the engines. Secret fuel mixtures are developed to enhance speed and performance. On a super speedway, race cars get less than two miles per gallon. Stock cars run on 110 octane, similar to the leaded gasolines of the 1970s. Champ Car and IndyCar teams run on methanol. This mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide provides the highest energy content for high combustion engines. It burns without a flame, making it invisible. This can be dangerous. Fortunately, water can easily extinguish the invisible flames. The good thing about it though, the flash point is much higher than gasoline, so it would take a, a pretty good spark to, uh, to set methanol off. While fuel has always been a necessity for the race car, structured wings on the car's chassis have not. Now it is one of the most important secrets of speed. A bigger engine was not the answer to increasing speeds on the track, so developers looked outside the car. Eliminating wind resistance would take the burden off the engine. It was the advent of aerodynamics that led to tornado-like speeds. Aerodynamics allows the car to split the air by design. This includes the placement of wings, fins, and even the driver's helmet. It is a secret process of speed known as downforce. Wings on a race car are similar to an airplane in the way it gains maximum speed and tries to maintain that in order to trick gravity. For the airplane, speed results in liftoff. In racing, it's just the opposite. Race cars stick to the ground because the wings are inverted, producing downforce. The wing design has become a key factor because what you do with the wings is pr produce a word called downforce. What that is, is actually like a person's hand pushing down on a matchbox car as you push it around the racetrack. That enables the car to go faster because it sticks to the ground more. And that's what aerodynamics and all the wings are on the race car for. The idea being a section of airplane wing inverted. It had the curved surfaces on the bottom of the side pods that created the low pressure so that the car was pulled down to the ground and given stability and, and kind of like a section of wing being pushed down to the ground the faster it went. Wings manipulate airflow to create downforce. This pushes the car down to the ground, producing higher cornering speeds. An IndyCar creates enough downforce to drive upside down on the ceiling. Located on the front and back of the car, wings direct air up and over the chassis. The car does not race against the air, it tricks it and forces it to split. Wings are set at various angles to adjust downforce. Too much downforce can make the car tougher to drive. More horsepower is necessary to push the car. Precise angles and degrees can be the difference in finishing first or last. Very small changes in these cars make a huge difference. Everything's measured in thousands, everything's very precise, and the driving is very precise. It has to be very smooth. To minimize drag, teams can adjust the wings. Three full turns to a knob on the front wing is equal to just one degree of modification. Even a half turn can improve a driver's position on the track. Additional downforce can also be created by ground effects. These are additional fittings and designs toward the base of the car. A chassis clearance is just inches from the ground. High speeds create a vacuum between the car's flat bottom and the air being sucked under it. The airflow around the car is critical on each component. It's not just the air that flows over the car, but it's also the air that flows under the car is, is actually a little bit more critical. You produce more downforce with the bottom of the car. Um, some race cars back at Detroit Grand Prix in the early 90s, they would actually suck a sewer cap, which weighs, I believe, 120 pounds, easily up. Adjustments to the wings are the winning difference. Teams tinker and adjust, hoping to find a secret advantage. If the angle of the wing is not balanced to the rest of the car, it can create lift. That's when air pressure builds up under the car and gives it an airplane effect. And the results can be devastating.
Clean air is a secret drivers search for as they slice down the straightaway. Turbulent air can disturb the way a car handles. Panels near the side of the car diffuse the bad air and make the drive smoother. Dirty or bad air can come from race traffic and weather conditions. The air box also helps to cool the car. Located just above the driver's cockpit, it catches the air forced over the top of the car and directs it into the engine. The side pods have been altered in recent years using computer technology. Side pods push the air around the sides of the car. This is used to help cool the car and deflect the air over the wheels and toward the rear wing. This air also finds its way into the coolant radiators and helps keep the inside of the car at a safe temperature. A fin on the back of this car was the closest early racers came to using aerodynamics. The 60s saw innovator Colin Chapman try upright wings on axles and in the rear of the car. This was just the first of a craze that sent teams on a quest for another secret. A major breakthrough was designing a car that sits low to the ground. Then came tinkering with the bottom of the car to gain the maximum downforce. Ground effects used in the late 70s allowed for even more suction to the track. Ducts and skirts surrounding the side pods made it easier for the cars to maneuver around tight turns. These attachments created a vacuum between the car and the road and set the standard for today's cars. Another secret was the fat wide tire. Just like the wings, engine, and chassis, tire design has experienced tremendous change thanks to technology. Engineers at Goodyear and Firestone Tire are developing compounds for tires to handle the turns and gain more gusto in the flat. The tires are a very complicated piece and you have things of both a chemist, which mix up, mix up the compounds which, which make the tire, and mechanical engineers work on the fibers. There's the tire is the most complicated thing. It's actually more complicated than the engine. We try to marry the information we get from the car designers, from the teams, uh, with what we have from the tire front and try to match the performance of the tire with, uh, with that of the vehicle and come up with, with an overall tire vehicle system that's the ultimate. Several grades of tire compounds give teams options. Soft compounds provide more grip when flying into the turns and holding ground, but the softest compounds last only a third of the entire race. Harder compounds provide less grip and speed, but more durability to withstand the bumps and knocks that occur during a race. We've made huge gains in, in, in grip. Um, you know, the aerodynamics of the tire are coming into play, of, of how much drag the actual tire has. So you have a lot of different factors that figure into the design of the tire and you know, it really makes it challenging for those engineers. New tires are hard to beat. Uh, you bolt new tires on, you instantly gain speed because you've got more grip, and uh, that's the hard part is managing your tires. Most teams qualify with their race day tire. Leagues have specific guidelines on how many sets of tires can be used. Some dictate how many are used for the entire race weekend to level the competition. Of the eight sets of tires used each weekend by the IRL, three will only be used during the race. Compounds are not the only secret to race tires. Temperature is essential to tires when they are not used. Pyrometers constantly keep accurate readings of the temperature and structure of the tire. Data tells the engineer why the wear of the tire structure has changed. Drivers weave before a race to warm up tires. Cold tires have not been acclimated to the heat generated by a 200 mile an hour car. In a matter of seconds, a race tire will reach nearly 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Drivers try to gradually get the tires warm so they don't explode when they accelerate to the scalding temperatures fast laps bring. Certain tires are desired to ensure an already worn feel. It makes getting to top speed easier. Drivers will also weave to scuff up the tires. This helps acclimate the tire to the track surface so it will be neither slick nor stiff. Racing is all grip. What you want to do with the tires is maximize your surface area, your contact patch. What that is allows the vehicle to do is go around the tight corner more because of the surface area. The weight of the car can lead to poor handling. 
Under race conditions, hot temperatures created by the rubber create friction with the track. This burns the tire and sometimes conducts so much heat it forces it to swell up and blow out. That is why nitrogen, not oxygen, is used to inflate race tires. Nitrogen forces the tire to expand less than oxygen. This prevents an expanded tire from being thrown off balance. Thin was in back in the 1920s when racing had its roots. Tall, skinny-spoked wheels were standard. Ray Haroon won the inaugural Indy 500 on these tires. A set was expected to last 60 miles before replacement. Tires gradually became shorter and wider. Aerodynamics played a role as engineers used the tires to provide better grip. Grip is the amount of rubber the tire puts on the track surface. The better the grip, the better the handling. Engineers wanted to keep the car close to the ground for more downforce. Fatter tires with more rubber made that possible. Fat tires became the standard in the late 70s. The car sat lower to the ground, giving engineers a broader base for wind resistance. Computers, aerodynamics, technological advancements are some of the secrets drivers put to use in 200 mile an hour traffic. While in the cockpit, the drivers have their own secrets. Piloting a race car is one of the most thrilling and dangerous jobs in the world. What other job allows you to legally break the speed limit in the most sophisticated vehicles ever made? The challenge is unlike any other. If maneuvering a flat-bodied race car at over 200 miles an hour isn't tough enough, throw in the aerodynamic equation that the principle of downforce creates as much as four times the weight of gravity. This is similar to the amount of force put on an astronaut when a space shuttle leaves the launch pad. The car is not the only part of the race team that takes a constant beating. On average, a race car driver must withstand four times the pull of gravity when at top speed. That's like having your body weight quadruple and thrown right in your face. This subsonic balancing act is exhausting on both the body and the mind. The pull of gravity is much worse when an accident takes place. Lateral G's are similar to a flat spin that airplane pilots can experience. These can reach nearly 70 to 80 times the pull of gravity. The head moves back and forth in the vehicle not only from the aerodynamics but also from the side load of the car. If the driver in the driver's helmet wants to go towards the outside of the vehicle in the corner, what you'd have to do is actually support the, the driver's helmet so he doesn't get neck fatigue and that's where the, the head rests and head supports become very critical because at the end of a 500 mile event, if the driver can't hold his, his head up, he can't be sharp and make quick decisions. The driver's head receives the most punishment. Oval tracks can do more damage to the driver's upper body. And the driver's helmet is very critical you can, and the speedway, they generally have a lot of different problems with the driver's helmet buffeting and moving around. I've heard stories of drivers having to hold their helmet, the, the lip of their helmet down because they didn't have it. The aerodynamics of the car moves the helmet around. All these different wicker bills allow the, the driver's helmet to be as stable as possible. It will actually just kind of push, push you down in the seat. And when I first ran the high banks, I actually had my helmet come down and it pulled my helmet down where I couldn't even see. So it just all that force is just really trying to suck you down in the seat. And uh, you know, it's uh, over the, the course of a 200 mile, a 200 lap race, you know, really puts a toll on your body. Pulled by gravity at over 200 miles an hour, the head and neck area must be cushioned and supported to absorb the constant strain of racing and the worst blows. The headgear of today's open wheel driver is aerodynamically molded to let air pass over the cockpit in the rear wings. Simple vents and waves in the helmet can give teams another secret edge in finding more speed. What is the profile of the perfect driver? Like a jockey in horse racing, the shorter, the better. To keep a streamlined design to the entire race car package, every piece must be as light as possible, including the driver. The ideal open wheel racer would be about five feet tall and well under 200 pounds. Drivers' bodies take a beating much worse than any football quarterback. 
To endure a 500-mile race, they must be able to absorb at least four times the pull of gravity. Their bodies contorted and confined in unbearable conditions for hours on end in searing heat that can dehydrate drivers. There's two reasons why racing drivers should train. The first reason is if you're in good physical shape, you won't be thinking about how tired you are. You'll just get on with the job you have of driving a racing car to the best of your ability. The second reason is that if you have an accident, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to understand that if you're in good shape and you have a bad accident, you will survive a lot easier than you would if you're not in very good condition. The strain on drivers' bodies can affect their minds. If they are tired or not physically fit, they can lose focus and concentration. If not at peak performance level, they will never be the first to the finish line. Staying in good physical condition is a secret many teams believe in. Not only for the driver, but the entire crew. Teamwork is crucial for these members of Panther Racing. They work day after day on Scott Goodyear's Indy Racing League machine. On race weekends, they form the fastest pit crew in the league, changing tires and adding fuel in under 14 seconds. That's why, inside this race shop, they not only get their car in shape, but also themselves. Several times a week, the race crew puts down the wrenches and picks up the barbells. A physical trainer supervises the mechanics, engineers, and race specialists in a rigorous routine of strength and endurance exercises. They've gained in strength tremendously. They've made anywhere from a 100% increase in what they're doing over to over 350% increase in their strength. All of this relates completely to what they're doing out there. The stronger they are, the more fit they are, the, the, the lower their chance of injury. They've cut their pit time tremendously. Especially on a hot day, we can outlast them because we're so much more fitter, we're stronger, and especially when it's hot, the heat will just drag you down a lot if you're not fit. By the time you've done eight pit stops, you're pretty tired. All of that hard work pays off when the pit crew steps into action. They're in the spotlight for only a few seconds. A slip-up might cost them the race. We're done. We're done. Driver Scott Goodyear is the team's marathon runner. He must perform without flaw for hundreds of miles without rest. Physical conditioning is what gives Goodyear and other champion drivers a secret edge. I had always run, I always worked out, and uh, I was always thinking I was doing the right thing. And I always felt good, I always took care of myself, eat well, and that sort of thing. But it wasn't until I broke my back in 1996 that I ended up coming to a facility called Hoffaker Training. And all of a sudden, the light switch came on. It was like, wow, there's a lot more going on here than I even realize. And you don't really need, you know, 50 or 60 pound weight. Sometimes 10, 15, 20 pounds and doing a specific way can really just fire the muscles up. That accident during a practice in Brazil sent Scott into a long rehabilitation. But what put him back in the driver's seat will stay with him a lifetime. I feel now if I had another accident, my injuries would not be as bad because I feel like I'm much more together, I'm, I feel like I'm fitter, and uh, I'm ready for anything that comes on, and that's the sort of thing that you have to be as a driver. Working with a conditioning specialist, Scott Goodyear has become one of the most consistent performers in the Indy Racing League. Race after race, you can find him on the podium. Goodyear is also aware that being in shape is one of the best ways to defend himself against further injury. I look at what we do is inside our office, in our cockpit, if you will, being relaxed, making sure that you're in control of the race car, your heart rate is somewhat low, even though you know you're still going to see 150 beats a minute. You have to be cardiovascular fit, you have to be endurance fit, you have to be mentally fit. And I think working out here, like what I do with all these guys at Hoffaker, I think gets me readily mentally fit, very mentally fit, along with being physically fit. It's a knowledge more than anything. Because if you don't have the knowledge, you're not going to do it. Nothing about it. But if these know, they know it's not more they have to do, it's just doing a little smarter how much more they get out of it, performance-wise. And that's worth that's worth careers. Like the marathon runner, the driver must avoid dehydration. Scott and his trainer pay attention to a healthy diet. You really have to be in shape. Um, you know, I, I train regularly, but uh, you know, I think there's nothing like doing it. And the more you run, the more you test, the better you, your body becomes acclimated to those kinds of forces. The secret in the gym and on the race course is repetition. From practice comes a better understanding of the car, course, and the crew. Before the high-speed traffic and 100,000 fans arrive, it's just the driver 
and an open road. On the average, a team will spend 20 days testing. That means no race traffic, no crowds, and no checkered flag. Just running over and over again. The monotonous work can be trying at times, but without testing, these teams will never see progress. The secrets lie inside the computers that store data from every test session. It is then applied to the car. The ultimate test is to get them here to test them on a race car and, uh, and make sure that everything uh, we think is going to happen does, true, does truly happen and, uh, and come up with, uh, with a good race recommendation. Test sessions have two purposes. First, the driver and crew get a sneak peek at the track before the race. That allows everyone to gather information on the special characteristics that make one track different from another. The second benefit from relentless testing is the potential to make the car perfect for that particular track environment. The car setup is not the same at every track. On an oval track, the tires must be set up to have heavy stagger. Stagger is when one side of the car is accommodated to routine tire strain. Oval racing is all left turns. This puts stress on the left side tires. Stagger positions those tires to accept the brunt of the tire wear. The right side tires will always be larger to help the car turn left. On a road course, the tires must be set up equally due to various left or right-handed turns. These sessions can help teams cut down on extra pit stops. Teams can coordinate mileage with fuel capacity and tire wear to get the most out of each stop. I think the testing is just an ongoing development process. You're looking for little gains. When the field is packed so tightly and maybe a tenth or two tenths of a second can be the difference from being on the pole or winning the race to being back in tenth or twelfth, every little bit counts. And so we go to tests just to fine tune and make sure the tire is the best it can be, but just as well that the driver has a good feel for driving the tire and the driver and crew can optimize the tire throughout the full race distance. Testing gives teams the data they need weeks or even months in advance to use come race weekend to formulate a game plan. A team prepared through practice inches closer for a chance at the checkered flag. Drivers never know what surprises will appear around the corners of a super speedway. That's why controlling the car is more than turning left or right. It's a secret only the seasoned driver can know. Driving techniques are only 30% of the actual race, but these secrets are what experienced drivers use beyond computers and technology. Flat out is the way a driver accelerates down a straightaway. This is where the driver gains momentum and sets up the best opportunity to pass. This is drafting. Two cars create a pocket of air. This allows the second car to trail or tow. Because the second car has less wind resistance, it uses less horsepower, and it can save that momentum for passing maneuvers. In open wheel racing, moves like this are more difficult because of the turbulent air that rolls off the rear wing. This move is performed routinely in NASCAR. Cars line up as many as 10 deep to create draft that allows for all cars to move faster. Corners are more difficult to negotiate. If a car fails to pass on the straights, then a technique called late braking or out braking is the best way to pass. This is done when one car uses less brake pedal to get around a turn or simply slows later in the turn. Each time a car heads into a turn, the wings are set up for a flawless approach. When the alignment fails, two kinds of problems occur for the driver. The first is called understeer or push. Push is when you turn the steering wheel and the front does not react as quickly as you want it to react. And it doesn't have an, as much grip. Very easy to deal with. You can compensate for push. Oversteer is the opposite scenario in which the wheels have too much grip. A loose condition is when the driver gives just a little bit of input and the rear of the car loses grip or the front gains grip. It depends that the rear of the car just gives up and rotates around. And that's usually when you see a car hit a wall backwards, it means Generally, it depends on the situation, but more of a loose car because what that enabled the driver to do is he snapped and came around, lost the rear of the car. Young drivers love driving loose. Old drivers love driving with push. Older drivers win more 500s than younger drivers do. Both problems can make for a temperamental car. Inside the driver's cockpit, there's a secret solution.
a luxury automobile, it is not. The confines of an Indy car are cramped, stuffy, and uncomfortable. Step into a thick flame retardant fire suit and wind resistant helmet, plus an array of seat belts, and it can be claustrophobic. I'm strapped in the car for safety reasons, as tight as I could be. I have a Kevlar seat that's made, that's molded around my body so that I don't have to compress my body when I have when I'm pulling G's in a race car. And we go to great lengths to make sure that it fits me perfectly so I'm not trying to hold myself up. The steering wheel is small and sturdy. In fact, it's hardly a wheel. The top of Eddie's steering wheel is cut away. That's so he can read the dash much, uh, much easier, much more clear. Think of the steering wheel as the keyboard and the dash as the monitor. The instruments on the steering wheel display standard data like speed, gas mileage, and RPMs. The confidential information is accessed on the LCD dashboard. It has a series of buttons to control fuel mileage, fuel mixture, speed, radio contact to the pits, and even a drink of water. One of the biggest safety features, I guess, of the car is the steering wheel that, that actually comes off. Uh, you just pull back on this, uh, this release mechanism, pull the steering wheel off, you can get the driver in and out uh, very easily. Eddie's got a couple buttons on the steering wheel. One is a radio button. The other button, it's a speed limiter. Uh, we usually have a speed limit in the pits. We can display any information that we're gathering on the car on the dash to the driver. The race car can become a frantic place to conduct business, while the steering wheel often gets the brunt of the frustration. The driver's not only driving the race car, he's listening to all this stuff, he's watching his computer gauge that's in front of him with 12 different functions on it that he has to sort of scroll through and keep in touch with, watching his mirrors, watching the competitors behind him, trying to pass the car that's in front of him. You're trying to do all that, trying to negotiate a turn at 200 miles an hour. So there's a lot of computing going on inside a driver's mind at the same time. And that's not all. Conditions constantly change for the driver, and communication is a key. Two-way communication between the pilot and his pit crew allows for crucial information to be discussed during the race. Once he's on the apron, it's my deal. Go for it. When we talk about drivers today trying to look for that advantage. Um, I think today's drivers are wired for technology in a lot of ways. We have uh, two-way communications back to the pits. We have two-way communications to what we call a spotter that's up in the stand. And so the driver can go around the racetrack and speak to the pits and talk about maybe chassis functions or engine functions. The spotter who's up in the stand who can see the whole racetrack is in communication with the driver constantly through a race telling him what's going on on the racetrack so maybe we can avoid an accident or anything that's going on. The driver's helmet contains a radio receiver and microphone. Antennas on the race car send the information to microwave receivers in the pits. From there, the crew chief and pit crew can talk to the driver, discuss any problems or concerns about the race. Is it hurt? No, it's not hurt at all, but I can't get the car to shift. Oh, you always want to be in contact with your crew because it's important, because as the race changes, as the fuel load goes away, the track gets slick, you want to make changes to your race car. And that communication with your crew chief enables you to keep your race car at optimal performance throughout the entire race. Dig it, kid. Keep digging. He's there. He's there. Conversations are kept at a minimum. The crew chief is the point person to respond. I think it's a really important part of what we do when it comes down to the strategy. I use it a lot for safety measures. Um, uh, we have people in the pits now that measure the telemetry of the car and the certain engine parameters they're always looking at in case of a failure. I want to know. I don't want to know three seconds after they knew. I want to know immediately. You lost the motor or cylinder? Over oh, the motor. Lost cylinders. Hang out for a yellow mark. The crew chief keeps in contact with the spotter. From a nest atop the race course, he monitors the entire racetrack. Still there. Side. Still there. Still there. Still there. Side by side. We're clear. This bird's eye view can be relayed to the driver who can see only 25% of the track. It really helped the safety situation. You know, we're we're talking about uh, running off of a turn down a straightaway and the yellow light comes on and your crew chief yells, there's a crash in turn two. Well, if you didn't have that, it, a guy can't write fast enough on the old chalkboard like we used to have to give you the message. So you sail down into one and there's the accident as you, are, as you go around the turn. And I think it's a, it's a safety item. 
Okay, it's all on the main straightaway. When an accident occurs, the spotter notifies the driver. Updates on the driver's position and lap times are fed to the cockpit. Scotty, you got five to go at the line. Five to go at the line. Keep digging. Simple codes or phrases help the crew to better understand the race the driver is running. In turn, the driver can get quick information and apply it without getting sidetracked from driving. Oh, 100% rear. 100% rear. 100% get in the rear. 100 in the rear. 50 in the front. Yeah, you can go more on the front. These frequencies can be monitored by race fans on scanners. So what's stopping the competition from eavesdropping? The radio frequencies are public knowledge, so if a team wanted to take all that time and have the, both the financial means and the team's energy to listen in to people, they do. There's also things that sometimes you don't want to, if you're having a problem, you don't want to let everybody else know you're having a problem. So that's where the conversation and knowing the driver, he can also sense in the driver's tone of voice if, you know, what, even what severity of a change he needs. Here comes their checker. Before radio communication, drivers would have just the roar of the engine to keep them company. Pit boards were the only means of sending messages to the driver. A pit crew member would leave short messages for the driver. If something was wrong, a pit stop would be the only way to discuss or even diagnose the problem. That cost a team valuable time. Today, split-second decisions are made by engineers and crew chiefs. Data by the gigabyte is a secret teams turn into time-saving measures on the track. How they turn a wealth of information into their advantage is the next secret of speed. The introduction of computers in the world of racing has changed the sport dramatically. We do more now with a laptop than when I tested for a Ferrari 22 years ago than they did with a whole team of engineers and 10 million dollars of computers. So it, it, it is consistently changing all the time. Engineers assimilate information from sensors throughout the car. From the shocks to the steering wheel, if data is produced, engineers can learn from it. Whether it's just a practice lap or a whole race, computer telemetry is the engineer's map to success. We can watch as things change in the car, if the driver makes an adjustment or something is going wrong. It's good for troubleshooting unless you know you have an issue, or if something that stands out, you can tell the driver to adjust a specific control on the car. Sensors on the tires, engine, suspension, and other internal parts of the car send 55 channels of data to an electronic control module, or ECM, mounted to the side pod of the car. This is similar to a black box on an airplane and serves the same purpose. The thing that really amazes me, not only from the crew chief and the crew watching the car go around the racetrack, maybe knowing something's going wrong with it, that's knowledge, that's experience, along with the engineer, just sort of seeing what he sees on his telemetry information on his computer and can look at all this sort of stuff before the car even comes in and knows what change he's gonna make. This information is sent to the engineers back at the pits. They will interpret these second-by-second -second readings on how the car is performing. This data is also stored in the ECM until the car returns to the pits. On race day, not only are drivers fighting for first place, but engineers are countering their opponent's moves in hopes of finding a hidden advantage. Right here on the screen, you can see the trend of how the driver is using his, his foot, which is a throttle pedal, to apply. Our goal on a race weekend is to have this line straight across. That means the driver is flat, or he's as fast as he can go all the way around the racetrack. Any time that this line drops down, we're slowing the car down. Split-second decision-making is crucial in race situations. Computer telemetry helps take out some of the speculation. For instance, the data received by computer gauges the fuel tank capacity on the car with the current speed the car is turning on the track. With that information, the computer can determine what lap the car should stop for fuel. When a problem occurs, engineers know it even before the driver. Data immediately detects the threat of danger. But despite the volumes of data flowing through computer lines, still the best source of information about the car is the driver. Teams meet regularly throughout the race season. A strategy is established for every practice session, qualifying run, and most importantly, the race. It's sort of like a chess match. Different plate people take a different approach. Some people gamble early, some people stay in pit with a leader. 
is a completely different approach and that's where the race strategy becomes very critical and the computers allow you to play that out. Taking care of all the small details. It doesn't matter if it's in the training of the guys, of the driver, of the last little design in the CAD CAM machine with the engineers, to the last little detail of the guys putting the car together in the race shop, and it all comes down to teamwork and communication. Teams will broach other puzzles, including fuel conservation, tire wear, and pit strategy. Each race has a different configuration and needs a new approach. So you no longer have extremes of a car being undrivable in a, on the other side of a car being well set up. You know what you're looking for, and so it's not just black magic anymore. Being in the right frame of mind is one of the most essential components to a successful race. Drivers will put on their game face and put everything else aside to focus on the race. My wife will tell you that I start to become a different person Thursday of race weekend, Friday, much, much a different person, and Saturday, Sunday, she says it's almost like I don't even know you because you get into such a trance. You know, you're so focused on what's going on. You're in harmony with the team, in harmony with the car, and everything that's wrapped around that weekend. One of the challenges a driver faces in the cockpit is mental exhaustion. During a 500-mile race, the mind can start to wander, so keeping mentally strong can make a difference on the track. The driver is, is concerned about how good does the car handle and am I faster than anybody else. You cannot drive a racing car if you're thinking of, whoa, whoa, that wall, if I hit that wall, I'm going to be decelerating um, at uh, 50 G and, um, and I have 6,000 pounds of inertia going in the wrong area. I mean, you don't, you don't think about that. You think of it in terms of, of positives. And never forget luck. It's still one of the key elements. Drivers say you can't win a race without taking a chance, but destiny is a potent ingredient in racing. Superstitions abound from race day rituals to the designs of the helmet. Superstitions are secrets drivers share with no one. On the road to victory, teams must stop for tires and fuel. The strategy in the pits is one of the most crucial. You just have to play your cards as the race, race evolves. Sometimes you don't know, it's like a more of a poker game, you hold different cards and, and until the last pit stop you might have held on to a good set of tires, you might have been working on fuel mileage and saving fuel and now you can run full lean. Different races require different race scenarios and race strategies. Pit stops can win or lose the race. For such a short amount of time, so much must be accomplished and with perfection. The secret recipe for a perfect race includes changing a 40-pound tire and adding 30 gallons of fuel in less than 15 seconds. A lot of times when a guy will slow down and, and his car will go away and he'll come in for a pit stop, make some adjustments, and then he will be right back up to speed. It's important for the crew chief to know when you roll up and, and you stop in that pit box exactly what to do to make those changes get you right back out. Three turns the front wing out too, three turns the front wing. Six crewmen are allowed over the wall in open wheel racing. The vent, or jackman, inserts a hose into the top of the car that sends the car up for the tireman to change rubber. There is one man to each tire with a pneumatic wrench who pulls off the old tire and fastens on the new one. Then the fuel man, dressed in full fire suit gear, including a helmet, sends gallons of invisible methadol into the car. The next challenge is making the car safer without losing speed. Teams are trying to find ways to make the car lighter, gain crucial seconds on the track, and interpret data that results in a better overall race car. Complete safety continues to be a goal. Our job as the engineer is always to look at both safety and speed. If at whatever rule package you have, if you look at the evolution of rules in cars and vehicles, as the rule packages try to constrain technology, what they try to do is limit technology. Tethering the tires is the newest safety feature. Tiny hair-like strands are bound into cables that keep the wheel and suspension tied to the car after an accident impact. This is to prevent tires and other debris from flying off the track or into race traffic. A car is racing at 240 miles an hour it doesn't allow for a lot of safety factors where if you can keep the speeds to a more sustainable level, it, it allows it to be a safer sport because of, as we approach and we make things better, the cars will always go faster. So what you need to do with the rules is, is maintain a more of a, a reasonable racing speed and therefore a, upon an unfortunate impact and, and things that happen in racing, it's safer towards the driver and spectators. Will we see 250 mile an hour laps in these cars? It's not impossible. 
finding a happy marriage between safety and speed, the secret is still out there. What makes one team a winner? It's what makes a race car and the team unique. A labyrinth of cryptic computer designs, long days, disassembling and reassembling the car into a perfect package. Rigorous testing of each confidential part. Developing the body, the mind and heart to go above and beyond. These skills lead to the taste of victory from mastering the secrets of speed.